Hi, this is Marcus. Just before you listen to our interview with Filthy Luca, please head over to our website, modernartisrubbish.com, where you can check out some of his works, just so you get an idea of the impact and scale of them. Hello and welcome to uh, Modern Art is Rubbish, episode number 32. Why am I laughing, Tom? Because we couldn't decide what episode it was and I, I thought, no, we're way past 32, <laughs> but we're not. We're not. Yeah, that's because I had that crazy bit where I decided to try and renumber the mini episodes, didn't I? It's like some kind of dictator who decided he wanted to reset the calendar for the these these shorter podcast mini episodes well i guess if you're in power which i guess if either of us is in power in this podcast it's you yeah but i'm, <laughs> I'm not the, quite the great I'm like dictator the sec- i'm like the foreign secretary or something oh no <laughs> that's 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 not a job that lasts very long <laughs> hopefully you'll stay on the podcast longer than that <laughs> oh you have you've been here a year I was reminded of a um, one of my favourite news stories. This is how random my mind is uh, from 1999. It's about an inflatable. You listening at home, this will become clear as to why I'm talking about this. Basically, the story was that a young girl was uh, was blown out to sea on a set of inflatable teeth, which is quite you know it's quite serious. It's quite an unusual incident, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, well, um, and basically, luckily, there was a man there who, uh, who rescued her and he was on an inflatable lobster. It wasn't Dali, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lobster telephone. Yeah, that'd be brilliant if it was Dali on his lobster telephone. But, and a coast guard uh, said that apparently this thing is all too common these days. Yeah, so where did this happen? Uh, somewhere in England, I don't know where. All right, yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. in a, in an art gallery. No, no, no. <laughs> this is a, like a real life story. Yeah, yeah. So. so I guess like the inflatable teeth is like some sort of uh, float that you might sit on with, for a bit of fun, was it? Yeah, yeah. If you were to go out far out at sea, I'd rather be on a lobster than a pair of teeth. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, she had to be rescued. She wasn't rescuing him, so that's the point, yeah. Are you wondering why... Well, no, you shouldn't be wondering why I'm talking about inflatables because we actually just interviewed uh, someone, a guy called Filthy Luca. It was a good interview, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um... No, so we just interviewed a guy called Filthy Luca. Yeah. And it was it was a really fun fun to hear, yeah. hear about his work, wasn't it? Yeah. He yeah, is actually someone who specialises in high quality uh, inflatable installations. And uh, do you want a bit of a biog before we go to the interview, Tom? Oh, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Filthy Luca is a Bristol-based mixed media artist, and he works with the artist Pedro Estrellas. And uh, they are famous for urban installations, which provide viewers with a new way to engage with the urban landscape. Uh, you know, they do things like they give trees personality by placing large inflatable googly eyes on them or making buildings appear as if a giant octopus is sort of like trapped inside by strategically placing inflatable tentacles on them. So as well as doing cool street art interventions, they also work together in a company called Designs in the Air and they have like a whole team of professional riggers and sewers and they make really high quality installations that they'll put on uh, on buildings for clients or install in, in, in places uh, which we'll talk about. So uh, on to the first part of the interview. We asked him how he met um, Pete. Hamilton, uh, a.k.a. Pedro Estrellas. And how they got started. How they got started. <laughs> <laughs> the, really, the reason I got into inflatables was because of my partner, Pete Hamilton. And mm. I, I was down one end of this big workshop and he was down another end of this workshop. 
And I was like messing around with my stuff. And he was like this kind of sci-fi guy down the end with all this inflatable stuff going on. And the story with him is, is that he started getting creative when um, he started helping out the youth project group in Bristol. And he ended up just doing various crafty things with them. And there's like a place in Bristol called uh, the Children's Scrap Store where we could get hold of loads of offcuts of cloth. And in Bristol, we've, we've got the biggest bouncy castle manufacturer and also the biggest hot air balloon manufacturer oh. in our town. So we would get all these scraps for nothing, or, or Pete did at the time. His mate had moved house. Someone had left a bouncy castle fan in the house. So he thought, well, I'll make an inflatable with scraps. And he made a big fish and plugged it in and it blew up, but it looked quite good. He's a really mathematical person. He's really into geometrics and stuff like that. And so he just got into making these little kind of one, one meter, two meter stars. Yeah. And um, he made this inflatable star quite pleased with himself. He just took it down to the, to the local cafe and like blew it up. And his mate saw it and went, oh, can you bring that to a nightclub tonight? <laughs> so he took it to the nightclub and hung it up in the middle of this club. And uh, some other guy saw it and was like, oh, can you make me six of them? And so like within like a couple of weeks, he was making inflatables for club decorations. Oh, amazing. Um, it was like about 93 or 94. So there was loads of clubs going on and loads of raves and stuff like that. And so he, he was suddenly decorating yeah. huge halls on his own. And so he'd been doing that for like about two years when I met him. And, um, and he was just sort of like, look, do you like to earn some money setting up my stuff? And for yeah. me at the time, I was about 22 or something. I was like, yeah, brilliant, you know, go and get paid to go to nightclubs. Because I'd done some sewing in the party. I just quickly got into making them as well. You know, within like three months, we were making inflatables together as well. So that's how I got into it. You know? So you, you formed a company of designs in the air. Was that something you formed together straight away and said, let's do a company or? Well, Pete called his first company Star Virus because he made these stars. And oh, yeah, like, the silver things. Yeah, I saw those. They're good. And he had this thing called Spiky Consciousness. And it's just everything was spiky. <laughs> like, balls with spikes and spiky stars and spiky tubes. And like going back to the maths, you know, like making geometric things, you can work out big patterns and interesting patterns by, by working with geometrics and maths, you know. And, and because the stars had suddenly got so popular so quickly he called it um star virus like it was a virus going around the world after that got a bit more serious and we were starting to do a bit of international work and because we we had a bit of a bristolian accent everyone was sort of kept going what's star voyeurist what star what is it and so to change the name we inflatable systems for a bit and then um basically we just got to a point where we brought in a manager and some advice for a business manager and Basically, we, we were just like slaves in our own business, and these people just ripped us off. They ended up stealing like 10 years of our, our artwork. Oh, crikey. Um, at that point, 2004, I think it was, there was like a big lull in our business because we'd just been ripped off. We didn't have a, any sort of business structure after that. And so I just started doing a bit of street art, and that was the kind of the beginning of the new business, really, because before that, we were doing nightclubs and festivals. Yeah. And we'd sort of go to festivals and look around and try and find new places to put inflatables and sort of try and find new ways of putting our stuff up. So we'd kind of looking around the place and say, oh, yeah, we could get a thing on top of that tent or, you know, we could put some stars on a pole or whatever it was. So we would walk around festivals looking for places to put the inflatables. And then when I was found myself kind of out of work for a bit with, with the business, we would just be walking around the city kind of looking for places. You know, it might oh, be cool. like, you know, a rooftop or like a lamppost or something like that. Yeah, so you were like just placing them on the street where you thought would look good, <laughs> like a yeah. like a graffiti artist. Yeah, kind of like that, you know. And also, we'd also when our stuff got a bit bigger, we used to take it into the street to to inflate it or into a park to inflate it to test it out because it'd be too big to blow up in our little workshop. And so we'd randomly inflate stuff in the street, and people go, "Oh, what's that?" And we just like come up with just random shit to tell them back, you know, like yeah. I found it in my attic and my mum said not to plug it in. So <laughs> and just like talk absolute rubbish to people. But it was quite fun. It was a little bit like um, extreme sort of sports, you know, you're going to inflate massive 10 meter diameter inflatable and then, you know, try and hold on to it. And uh, <laughs> is it all air in all those inflatables? Yeah, it is. It's all air. So you need a fan. You need to plug them in. Um, but it's all packs down really small. So you can take them to funny places, you know, like you can kind of like pack it in a bag, yeah. climb through a building, you know, and get, get in and get up onto the roof and then inflate something that's as big as the building. 
you know what I mean? Or as big as the house, you know, if you wanted to sort of thing. So Yeah, well, like from a backpack. Yeah, a lot of our stuff packs down to really, really small. Yeah, so it's really yeah. good for travelling with. So that's part of the success of our business is being able to turn up and do that, you know? Absolutely. So uh, you're quite well known for the, the Octopied, which I really like because it sort of reminds uh, us of that kitsch sort of 1950s, 60s alien movies. It looks like a kind of like a, a, an octopus that's trapped inside a building. One I was really interested in, I was looking at one you did on Cavill, is it Cavill Avenue? It's like on a real tall, tall building. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 in Aston, Australia, yeah. It's on a skyscraper. Well, I mean, the tentacles go around, we, they're our most popular thing and they go around the world. And I mean, they're successful for a few reasons. I mean, originally made them, um, quite small and uh, it was just a complete joke because well, there was this event in Bristol called Front Room yeah it's a little area in Bristol that does that does um, the event Front Room and artists in that area open up their front room and show their work and so all these streets have artists um, and so somebody wanted me to exhibit in their front room but obviously our stuff's <laughs> really big it looked like their front room had been taken over by an <laughs> But so I made them really quickly in in like just a day or something. They're about three meters long each. These three tentacles, and then a photograph of that had got out and onto the internet and into a magazine, I think, as well. And then uh, and then the next time we got a call, someone saying, "Oh, can we have the octopus tentacles?" And they sent a picture of this massive building. So it was like, "Oh, shit, we've got to make them a bit bigger." Then <laughs> so it's just a joke gone a bit kind of out of hand, really. Also, with our stuff, we try and make everything. Even if it's just a stupid joke, we try and make things look good, you know, and we try yes. and really enjoy, you know, we want to enjoy the form and work with the material and the medium, make it look beautiful, even if it's just a sort of little joke. But the attraction, you know, like people who are into architecture and stuff like that really like it. To coin one of your phrases, it juxtaposes with the <laughs> What I like is I like the fact that it makes you sort of relook look at the landscape, how you engage with the urban landscape. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the instant nature of that that helps, you know, because one minute it's not there and the next minute it is there. So, you know, if you've seen it being constructed over time and yeah. read about it and it's all yeah, yeah. it's all planned and kind of, you know, it gives people time to complain that it's going to happen, doesn't yeah. it? We're not taking over buildings. We're kind no. of just, we're just kind of uh, interacting with them. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. really important for us to be site-specific and to kind of be part of what's going on around it. And so yeah. the thing with the tentacles is that, you're only putting a couple of tentacles in the building, but you're putting them in the right place and it makes the building look like it's a whole art piece. But you've only yeah, put, yeah. Really oh, put yeah. one thing out of that window and another out of the other. The same with the eyeballs, you know, it's just like you're putting two eyes on it, but the sculpture's the whole tree, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the whole tree looks like a crazy hairdo, but you just put a couple of inflatable balls in it, really. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. reconstituting it. Yeah, it's e e e easier to put them in than Jean-Claude and Christo. Yeah. <laughs> You know, essentially, it's trying to be efficient and uh, trying to make the most out of less, you know, in a way. Yeah. And it's pretty temporary. It's not expensive. And like the John Claude and Christo and sort of Anish Kapoor with his giant and inflatably made, a lot of those things are quite just working with scale, like massive size yeah. things, you know. And ours are quite big, but actually, you know, it's, it's a little bit illusion, really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Tom, when I was a uh, kid, I used to have a thing called Ansari, and they had cartridges. Uh, I had a game which was uh, Space Invaders, although uh, my brother used to play it m a lot more than I did, so he because he was like the master of it. And I always remember that he used to have like these boxes for the game, and it had like incredible artwork. So, for instance, the Space Invaders one, you had like all these uh, kind of like spaceships, like amazing, like invading aliens. And the actual... Uh, graphics was never quite you had to use your imagination a lot the graphics was never quite up to the actual box all right so the graphics is just like a blob yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and the artwork is like a, a picasso yeah. or something uh, yeah i had yeah <laughs> <laughs> incredible i had this game called adventure and i loved it and it was incredible i, I mean the box had this like this dragon and uh, the guy with the sword you know it was incredible and then I actually uh, had a look on the internet uh, f uh, not so long ago to check out what the actual game adventure looked like. And I thought, crikey, I must have had an amazing imagination. 
I'd say the dragon looked more like a duck than a dragon. It's often, it's often the way with uh, dragons, though, isn't it? <laughs> or duck and dragons. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, which brings us on quite nicely to the next bit where we asked him, uh, we asked uh, Luke about his installation that he did in Manchester, which was uh, kind of recreating a Space Invaders game. But what was really interesting, it was using... Uh, so the, you know those sort of safety barriers that they put up around sort of like when they're doing gas works and traffic cones and we asked him about it it was an installation that he did in Manchester yeah and here it is <laughs> <laughs> really interested in your a couple of other pieces if that's all right if we can talk about those as well I really like this one you did at Manchester as part of the sort of like a red stripe art project which was a, a space invaders on the side of a building well, that was interesting. They just phoned me up. I just had the idea on the phone when I was talking to them. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, you literally sort of what, of using traffic cones and, and like safety barriers to make a... Yeah, you want to describe it. Yeah, so basically I got the phone yeah. call and um, they just said, we've got this project um, and it's to do with making artwork out of the everyday objects around you. Yeah. And I sort of said, well, we could make, a giant space invader game out of these out of loads of work for Lars, maybe <laughs> they look a bit and they were like yeah brilliant you know so um <laughs> the idea was that uh, we put them up on the wall on yeah. a black drop and then i was going to just put lights around them so kind of led light strip comes yeah, like yeah. light they glow and then my mate who does our lighting went oh well do you want us to make it into an interactive game and i was like well fuck yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> And we do that. So we, we sort of did it, but we did it in a really short time and on a real bit budget. So I'd like to do it again properly. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant because it lights up at night, doesn't it? So that people can actually press, what they press the button and it can actually shoot. Yeah. To make it look like it's moving, the lights kind of um, will be on, on the alien that's meant to be moving. So I guess it's like an old, one of those old games where all the kind of, graphics are there but they just have to light up for them to be yeah kind of see, you know what i mean i used to have pac-man game like that and you could see if you turned it in the sun you could see all the positions they were already going to be in yeah yeah, it's yeah exactly that so so that was the idea so it'd light up and that would be the track of of the alien yeah. and then we had one traffic cone and with an led strip going up um, as you press the button on a bollard it would send like a flash of light up the, if you hit the alien at the right time then it would blow up. <laughs> the next thing uh, we talked about was uh, we asked him about this incredible interactive inflatable called Moosey. And it's kind of like a white inflatable with sort of three cones coming out of it. And uh, basically people can interact with it and it makes beautiful lights and creates beautiful, interesting music. And uh, if you go to the website, there's a link uh, to a video where you can see it. And it's a really wonderful piece. Tom, have you ever had any experiences with, uh, with interactive music therapy kind of things? No, but I used, to, I used to work in music therapy. Oh, did you? Yeah. Any, yeah. Anything happen? Well, I don't know. We'd have sessions with uh, young adults. Yeah. And this guy used to run it. It was in London. I went to this group and he, he'd turn up he was like some old muso guy yeah. with, with missing teeth like yeah. you do <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be like oh tom it's great to see you <gasps> oh you'll be on base today you'll be on base today <laughs> was he like a, like a... we'd sit around in a circle he'd always be on like guitar yeah why was he always on guitar i don't know he that was his <laughs> like you know he'd lead the jam yeah but he'd want want me to join like because yeah. i'd turn up because i was a musician he'd yeah, be like yeah. he'd try and get me like really involved in it and then he'd give pass instruments round to all the uh, people who'd come along. Yeah. Everyone would have an instrument, whether you were a carer or um, a, a service user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, everyone would get an instrument, and we'd sit around in a group and we'd just jam for. Could go on for a few hours sometimes. You know, long sessions. So you're being paid to jam. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's a dream job, isn't it? Yeah, Somebody. but you had to be, re you couldn't like lose yourself in the yeah. game. <laughs> you know? What do you mean? Did you like, no, you didn't knock any, you didn't knock any of the sort of well, clients out of the way so you could do a big solo or something well, like that? Well, you wouldn't want to like do it. Well, my particular client would be at risk of running out the building, <laughs> running across the road and going in a, going and, you know, 
doing something quite uh, yeah. that would be yeah. bad for his oh, health. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you'd so. have to like, <laughs> you'd have to have one eye on your solo, one eye on. Oh your yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can go <laughs> full on Hendrix. Or anything. <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's a really cool video that we've put a link to on the website where you can see how this this wonderful uh, uh, interactive sculpture works with with therapy. So uh, uh, in this uh, section, what are we doing, Tom? Uh, oh Luke, yeah, so it... we asked we asked uh, Luke about uh, about Musi and what it was about. Yeah, yeah. And here's what he said. Yeah, cool. And here's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> myself i always sometimes question like the value of what i do and i was really interested in the project you did called uh musi uh the is it musi is that how it's pronounced musi yeah musi yeah Muzi, i didn't yeah. know i was always near saying musi musi yeah, yeah. So interesting to hear about that it really seems like a really positive kind of project yeah i mean yeah so musi stands for um multi-sensory interactive inflatable Oh, cool. Yeah, nice. <laughs> it's actually an acronym. Stop slamming the door. Yeah, that, well, that came about, uh, about with the same guy that, that made the uh, Space Invader uh, thing interactive, a guy called Lex Cousins, just has kind of hacking and programming abilities, you know. He's just a pretty clever geezer, yeah. Yeah. a friend of mine. And um, so that came about because he st- when I got him in to do our lighting, because, you know, we had all the stars and everything. Yeah. And we put them up. And we, LED lights started to become affordable. Um, we started to put these LED color changing lights into our sculptures. Yeah. And then we wanted to program them so they would actually uh, change color, you know, and we could set nice sequences. So we needed to get a nice way of um, making the colors change. Next, we started um, programming our lights with a uh, music making system called Cubase. Yeah, it can't I like Cubase, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we had to write a bit of script to make the Cubase run the light. Um, when he did that, I was like, oh, that's really good. I didn't know he could do programming. So I said, well, can we, let's get a sensor. Because pe- we would put our sculptures up at festivals and stuff, and people go, oh, what is it, and when does it do it? You know, and it'd be like, well, it just it's there, and it is what it is, you know. So he thought, oh, we'll put a sensor on it. So when people walked up to it, the lights would change, you know. Sounds that coming out of it would change as people walked up to it. So we got hold of a scent. The obvious place for us to put this like uh, infrared sensor was like in the inflatable to keep it safe and dry and everything. Um, but then we realized that the um, infrared beam didn't pass through the cloth. So you yeah. had to actually touch the inflatable to oh, wow. the That's beam. Yeah. We just quickly made a little inflatable and, and it worked. We, when you press down on the inflatable, it changed the signal so we could change the, the lights. But because we were running our lights through a music making system, it was really obvious to kind of make it make music as well. Yeah. And so like we basically invented in about like an afternoon and then we thought, oh, this is really good. Let's take it to um, people we knew who do like play and play and kid stuff and experiment it. So we kind of experimented with it for about five years oh, wow. and developed it. So that was about eight years ago. And so three years ago, we kind of launched it properly since then we've just been developing it and we've sold about 60 of them um yeah. to various special needs schools yeah i mean i love it sort of like a white inflatable sculpture with three cones and and i liked in this video i watched it was that the, they had children with special needs and they were able to interact with it and one thing i i noted was there was like one child who had they were saying that had problems with with mobility and and, and they they were encouraged to move in order to make it play music and and change lights and it was a really good sort of therapy for them and I really like that. Yeah, you know we've not really made money out of it for the past eight years, but I um, mean, but but the business has sustained itself. But the reason we've carried on doing it is because every time we've taken it out, it's just been really kind of moving and really yeah. encouraging. You know, like like kids really love it and they really get into it. Yeah, certain people especially autistic kids mm. they just get so much out of it that it's like yeah you can see that's such a brilliant product you know and um but um we've got so far with it now we need to sort of uh, look for investment really because we've developed it and we've taken it out and we sold them and we've dealt with it and run the business that's just about sustained itself yeah. but we need to really kind of get out there and show the world it's there and market it yeah. and stuff like that so we, we we love it because it's just such a positive 
sculpture like that. Yes, it is it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, you, Marcus, was saying to me, like, oh, I wonder if he's going to make an adult-sized one yeah. at some point. Well, that, well, adults can use them. We use them. I mean, Lex makes music. He uses them to uh, to compose on sometimes because what you can do is you can choose uh, your sounds. So each cone has got a different sound, and you can choose the the, the key you're playing in. And you can even choose the scale you're playing in. So, yeah, or yes. if you're not a brilliant keyboard player, but you make electronic music, this just allows you to kind of wobble it around a little bit and come out with beautiful sounds, you know? Oh, I'd, I'd love yeah. to see someone performing with one, like an artist. Oh, yeah, there's no yeah. possibilities with it on the musical side. Yeah, can you program podcasts as well? Oh, pop- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> um, right, we've been doing this podcast for about a year, over a year now. And you know what? You've never once asked me about my practice. Do you know that? Oh, okay. So, Mark, tell me about your practice. Well, no, it's a bit late now at the moment. We'll talk about that on another pod, I think. Um, but in this bit, uh, I actually asked Luke about his practice, uh, considering I've only uh, ever spoken to him once. I actually asked him about his practice. Well, get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I get asked things by people who are actually interested, it's like, how do you make these things and how do you oh, go okay. about it? And um, so there may be that we should talk on, about that a little bit, you know? Yes, great, great. So how do, how, do you, how do you go about making them then? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> when you a client meets you uh, do they have a specific idea what they might want I know you said they might want tentacles but do you ever have a client that comes up to you and says look I don't know what we want we've got this space what can you do for us have you, do you yeah, have that? well we love that if that happens um, if they've got some money and a nice space then we love that because because um, the way that our business is structured now you know, I get to like draw stuff, and then you know, once the client wants that, says I want it, I get to kind of just discuss that with Pete, my partner, mm. and we together kind of work out how it's going to look. And a few other people in the business as well get involved, and then Pete will then break it down in 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 three D and design it a three D shape that then gets unwrapped in three D as well and t- is turned into um, flat panels that we then print out onto paper. And then we kind of layer up all the cloth and then place the paper patterns down on top of it and sweep it all flat and then staple it oh. all down so the patterns are nice and flat and down on top of the cloth and then cut it all out with a sharp knife. Then those pieces get stitched with sewing machines um, together and once it's completed, we can inflate it with a fan. You know, it took, took us years to kind of get to understand inflatables properly and how the cloth works and how... The st- how construction works you know you know although lots of people do 3d design not everyone can make inflatables because there's sometimes there's internal bits that you can't see that you need to use or there's um well there's parameters like you know if you make one section can only be so big before it kind of starts to lose its shape um you know or how do you get around making things that you know can you make things that are flat-sided you know, there's just loads of little things to know. And um, it's just experimenting, finding out all the different shapes you can make with inflatable. You know, it's one of these things that's really important to kind of work with the medium. You can't just make anything. You've got to make, you know, certain things are easy and certain things are important. Yeah. You know? So you have a sort of team, you said you have a team of people that are sort of like professionals with large industrial, is it sewing machines they would use? Is that correct to say that? Yeah, yeah, we've got like about eight sewing machines and a bunch of sewers. And um, over the years, we've um, we've got a rapport and a way of working together where some of the riggers and technicians get involved in deciding, you know, where are we going to put the sandbag weights or where are we going to put the, uh, you know, the tethering points or, you know, how big a fan do we want or, you know, you know, even the riggers kind of help, you know, Chris, who's here now, is like, you know, deciding what shape it might be so it's going to work well in the wind because the wind yeah, is yeah. a big factor. You know, so there's loads of experience that goes into the actual design of why we would make something that shape, you know? Yeah. 
And I, I guess they so, get re, they get reused some of them, don't they? I suppose because of your uh, yeah, rental, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, totally. You know, that, that, like it's a rental business, and so it's really important to us that it gets reused again and again. You know, and um, so we make them really strong, but also because they get transported, they've got to be really light. So we make them strong in the right places mm -hmm. and kind of lighter in the places that don't need to be so heavy. Uh, the next thing is, I was on the beach and I took a. Uh, it's interesting. I, I saw there's a giant flip flop. I actually put a link to that on our Instagram uh, on on the beach, and it's like a shower with a giant flip flop. Have you seen it? It's near. It's on on Brighton Beach where we are. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I took a photograph of that, and I thought well, I'll share that. And of course, it's advertising a particular brand of flip flops, uh, famous Brazilian brand brand brand. I don't know how. Are to they think. famous? This Brazilian brand of flip flops. Yeah. Don't you know? Can't you name them? Because no, with age, no. we haven't been paid, so we can't yeah, mention yeah, yeah. it. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Other brands of flip-flops are available, even though I haven't mentioned that one. Um, but do you know what's really bad is I actually just found out that flip-flops now, you can get fined money if you drive in flip-flops, I was reading. Have you ever tried to drive in flip-flops? Not that I'm saying you have. So for the record, had you ever decided to drive in flip-flops? Are you telling me there are actual laws in our legal framework in this country that... I saw your... it today. <laughs> it actually came up. Now, how the hell did it know that I'd photographed a flip-flop? I haven't even spoke to anyone about that. And, and yet, a news story about driving in flip-flops appeared in my news feed. Well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe Facebook or Google are just warning you. Yeah, or Facebook. Well, 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 we're, talk we're talking. Well, I haven't Facebook got a car, and I haven't got any flip flops. Though. Yeah, but you've mentioned flip flops. They they don't want you to commit any crimes. <laughs> They're in enough trouble <laughs> any, as it is with governments around the world. Yeah. Facebook without, <laughs> without flip flop danger. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I shared it. Thinking about that, it was just that it, it reminds me of the this next part in the interview where we asked him. Um, you know, what, what it's like working with companies and, and how, how does that actually work? And how does it benefit the company to yeah. have um, some inflatables coming out the top of your building? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how? <laughs> done things for things like publicity stunts, for things like Greenpeace with inflatable fish balls. And then they've paraded these pieces through London and kind of gone up to like, you know, um, the House of Parliament or to, uh, where did they go actually? They went to um, BP or something like that and kind of, you know, banged on the door and just did a big oh. protest. And cool. what that got them is loads of kind of visual, you know, people see them in the street and then they make a film and it looks beautiful. And if it yeah. looks good, then it goes out onto the internet and it's something interesting and, and beautiful to look at, you know? Yes, yeah. Um, and our last job was uh, for uh, the English Heritage. Yeah. Um, and we went up to Whitby Abbey where they've got this, big um ruin abbey and um they put an old legend the, the abbey got a, attacked by snakes and like saint hilda kind of cast these snakes down by the power of god and all the snakes kind of tumbled over the cliff and coiled up and turned to stone and their heads smashed off and that's why you get all the ammonites at the bottom of the cliff oh, on cool. the beach yeah oh, funny story <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a cool story. And so the English Heritage thought, you know, they want more people to go to their to visit their sites and join English Heritage. And so they they got us to make all these inflatable snakes to attack the Abbey with. And and um, because of what we did, they got um, into onto a bit of uh, TV and they got into the local paper and they got into that. They got I think they got like front page of the Times or something with it. It's like you know a bit of a payout to make a load of snakes, but it looked really good and they got, and they got into all the papers with it. It was worth yeah. a lot of money in terms of advertising. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and yeah. they kept the snakes right. as well, so they can use them again. So it's massive on the media. Because people like to have things to look at and, uh, you know, we get Instagram pictures of our stuff as soon as they're up all the time, you know. And so, you know, in terms of social media, our stuff's really powerful because, you know, as soon as something crazy and, and brightly colored ends up on their streets it's you know it's just instagrammed constantly you know you can't kind of buy advertising like that otherwise you know you've got to get you know like that kind of user generated content or whatever they call it oh, you know yeah. where people you know putting out their own pictures and if you can get a hashtag in there or something like that you know yeah we, i mean we quite often don't ever put our name or anything on our pieces so people don't really know where it's from or why it's there but um but if it but if but other companies do do it and they kind of 
um, get us to make loads of big things and then they'll quickly take some pictures and put some hashtags out there yeah. and then everyone else who's taking the pictures knows what it is all about. And yeah, oh, nice. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good way of attracting attention and having some fun. And, you know, it makes people smile. And that's the sort of main thing, really. It kind of brings a bit of colour into the world, you know? Yeah, it's really, it's a really good window for art. I think a lot of people that don't necessarily like sort of mainstream fine art, when I've shown, shown people your work, they get it straight away as yeah. art. Yeah, well, I mean, we've got some kind of themes that we can kind of keep, go back to, which are just to do with like nature be you know, coming back and, and taking over the world. Yeah. And, but, but a lot of it isn't necessarily that highbrow, but it's just a bit of fun. But it's a bit yeah. of fun that we've committed to on a massive scale, you know. So yeah. kind of, but like I say, we really put a lot into the design and to the getting a really nice quality thing. So it might be a silly idea, but we've put loads into the design and the making, the execution of yes. it. So, yeah. Yeah, it works on a few different levels. Yeah, the kids love it, but it is. But you can look at it in different ways, you know. And um, great, right? Yeah, nice thanks, one. Luke. Thanks, yeah, Luke. Thanks, man. Cheers, man. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Take care now. All Take right. Care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So, um, yeah, that was a really good interview, Tom. Anything inflatable you want to... Oh, yeah, I saw... Have you seen the film uh, Blow Up? Um, no, I haven't. That's good. It's not about inflatables, though, but it's a 60s film. It's slightly misogynistic, I have to say now, watching it back, but it's a classic film about a, uh, a photographer. It's all very, very, very 60s, and it's about a photographer who thinks he's seen a murder when he blows up his photographs. Oh, wow, yeah. It's a different kind of inflating... Graphs. Well, I know that there's a band called Blown Out, so a, rec- a recommended band, Blown Out, Impious Oppressor. Oh, that's good. Got, I've got no other, uh, no other uh, inflatable kind of links. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, inflatable links. That's quite futuristic. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've got a lot of things going on. We've got a new YouTube channel. What's the YouTube channel address? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, Tom, if people go to our website, we've got new uh, buttons on there where you can actually get gain access to all our uh, social media Are accounts. They Is there another word for those little things? Round social media presser honours. Oh, right, yeah. yeah that's the, uh... Something like that. Presser honours is the right word. But anyway, so... We love to hear from you, so you can get hold of us on email. What's our email address? Info at modernartisrubbish.com. We like to tweet a lot, and you can follow us and find us on... Oh, twitter.com forward slash modartisrubbish. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that I don't think that mod art is rubbish, and I really, really like Peter Blake's cover for Stanley Road. Stanley, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very good. <laughs> I recommend people check it out. Um, and also we're on Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash modern art is rubbish. Please remember to follow us on your chosen pod distribution application. And also, it does cost us to to do this podcast and uh, any donations uh, greatly appreciated you can find out more on our patreon page which is patreon.com forward slash modern art is rubbish and it's just buys then Tom it's just blowy buys <laughs> boy <laughs> bye 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 bye